Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. To some people, the idea of a planet-wide city might seem undesirable or even nightmarish. But for centuries, sci-fi writers have dreamed and theorized about the future of Earth's cities. What happens when we begin to run out of valuable real estate? Where do we go if we can no longer build horizontally? Well, the theory has always been that we'll continue going upwards. In 1967, the word ecumenopolis was coined by the Greek city planner Constantinos Apostolou Doxiaitis. If you search his name in Google Scholar, you'll find several articles in which he discusses the idea of a single continuous world city. The end result of the current urbanization patterns, population growth trends, combined with the increasing ease of transport and rapid development of new human networks. I'm sure even Constantinos at the time could not predict the crazy social media networks and information revolution that would connect human beings closer together than ever before. But even before Constantinos, there were other human beings talking about this idea of a worldwide city. For instance, you have the fictional world of Trantor from the Isaac Asimov Foundation novels, which has just been recently brought to life on Apple TV. Minds like Asimov and Doxiaitis have always championed this idea that if societies continue to develop unharassed, they will eventually develop a universal worldwide city. An ecumenopolis just like Coruscant. And that's something that's always excited me instead of filled me with doom or dread. Before we continue though, a quick word from our sponsor for today's video, Unisaber.com, one of the premium lightsaber manufacturers in the Milky Way. Their Black Friday deal will extend until the end of November. If you buy any of their replica category sabers, you get a pad of one category saber for free. Simply add both blades to the carts and their system will automatically add the savings for you. I do really recommend you guys check out Onisaber.com's replica blade category. You'll find some of their best designs here, including some pretty awesome, lesser known character blades. We have, for instance, Deepa Beliba's lightsaber right here, the Redemption Blade of Saj Ventress that you would use after she leaves Count Dooku and the Sith. There's also Cal Kestis's blade fixed and Cal Kestis's blade broken. You also have Qui-Gon Jinn's blade and Savage Opress's blade, Kanan Jarrus's blade, Dooku's blade, and many, many, many more. So if this sounds like something you guys are interested in, check out the description down below for more information about this deal. Thank you for your patience. On to the rest of the video. Now, one of the core elements of the Foundation series is this pseudo field of study that Asimov kind of theorized or created that combines mathematics, predictive modeling, physics, anthropology, and many other things. It's known as psychohistory. And the characters within the show are able to use large sample sizes of humans, expose them to stimulus, and predict their reactions using psychohistory. Of course, I say pseudoscience because turning a human being into a data point is still relatively complicated if you're talking about, you know, making larger predictions of how society will operate in the future based on just some stimulus you give them right now. Now, Asimov is more famous for his three laws of robotics. A robot cannot harm a human being. The first law of robotics. The second law state that a robot has to obey any order given by a human being. The third law states that a robot can defend itself. He's considered by many as one of the most important creative and philosophical minds in science fiction. And this idea of psychohistory to me is probably one of the more interesting contributions he's given to the genre, especially with the advent of quantum computing and increasingly sophisticated simulations that can be done by computers. I feel like this idea of predicting human behavior is becoming closer to reality than ever before. If we could only apply the principles of psychohistory to our own world, maybe we could learn more about future trajectories of how our planet will grow. We could take a look at uh, numbers like the following. According to the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, in 1950, roughly around one third of the population on Earth lived in urban settings. And by 2050, it's predicted that more than two thirds of our population will be living in cities. And according to estimates from the World Bank, currently around 56% of the population lives in cities, about 4.4 billion inhabitants. And this most likely is because 80% of global GDP is actually generated in those cities. And it is interesting that organizations like the United Nations and the World Bank would be interested in such statistics. And that's because organizations like the World Bank, these multilateral development banks, are crucial in the first step in speeding up the process of globalization, which will be crucial in creating this world city. Now, granted, in the last few decades, the word globalization has been seen as a dirty word, and, you know, people think the World Bank is run by crazy reptilian elitists. Whether that's true or not, it's still up for debate. But if we take a look at the longer course of human history and the trends of human civilization, the development of human society from small tribes to villages to fiefdoms and kingdoms, city-states to 
nations is a trend that will only continue to grow. After the disastrous conflict that was World War I, the planet tried to unite behind the flawed League of Nations. When that organization failed to create a lasting peace and World War II erupted, the United Nations was created. It learned from many of the mistakes that the League of Nations made, and it was still a flawed organization, but it was a move in the right step. The United Nations' strength is that almost every territory on Earth is a member, and its biggest weakness is that every territory on Earth is a member. It's hard to get so many different people from different backgrounds with different political views to agree on anything. And that has a lot to do with the fact that Earth is a relatively young civilization, and most of the different groups on Earth grew up relatively isolated from one another uh, until like the last few hundred years. If you take a look at the Republic in Star Wars, it's existed for more than 25,000 years, and Coruscant is believed to have a history that goes back almost a quarter of a million years in Legends. Human civilization here on Earth, well, we have a recorded history of, I don't know, five, 6,000 years? Not much more than that. The fact that we still have 195 countries and territories, all with unique people, belief systems, and cultures is what makes our planet so vibrant. And really in the last few decades, have we become more and more intertwined as a planet and people? We're not just talking about physical transport like the advent of airplanes, but the ability for people to communicate with each other, first through telegrams, then through radio, and then through TV signals. And finally, now we have the internet, which we can access in the palm of our hands with a smartphone. And so now whether you're in New York City or New Delhi and everywhere in between, there's a good chance that you are connected to the world through this device. And through that device, you're able to enjoy some of the same music, entertainment, and news that people all over the world are enjoying simultaneously. When that happens, you can start developing similar, I guess, values and, and life experiences to people who are in a completely different part of the world, who might have grown up completely different from you. And that's only increasing more with the next generation of kids that are growing up right now. I mean, I take a look at my own nephew and niece, and uh, I notice that although they do watch some domestic content, most of the content they watch comes from the internet, and it comes from the international community. And you see a lot of these creators, especially ones uh, creating content for kids, they kind of eschew any national or linguistic cues and adopt a more global approach to content. And they usually use English as a language to communicate with people from all around the world. I just recently listened to a Bloomberg profile about the YouTube channel known as The Billions. They have like 27.9 million subscribers and they make silly English videos and songs geared towards kids. They have a huge international following and guess what? They're all from the relatively unknown country of Kyrgyzstan. This is a small landlocked nation in Central Asia with a population of just 6.7 million people. Yes, The Billions has more subscribers than Kyrgyzstan has people. And prior to The Billions, I think Kyrgyzstan was known to the world best because of a popular Vice documentary detailing the practice of bridal kidnapping in society. And yeah, that still does occasionally happen, although incidents have decreased a lot in you know, the last decade or so. But this is what information, this is what content, this is what culture is going to look like in the future, especially as new generations replace the older ones and we kind of consume this content that's created not just by one nation, but by a global society. Even though there are momentary setbacks like World War I and World War II, the Cold War, and the recent political crisis that is erupting all over the world, I think in the long run, um, not only will humanity not destroy itself, we'll continue to grow as a society. I think a lot of that depends on just how well connected the planet is to one another. And so let's go back to these multilateral development banks that are honestly so misunderstood by most people. And I guess that's what happens when you put too many resources and power in one place. I mean, people tend to get suspicious, which is really understandable. But the concept between the five multilateral development banks in the world, the World Bank, Inter-American Development Bank, Asian Development Bank, African Development Bank, and the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, is that they serve as financial institutions for countries that are unable to raise funds themselves for important development projects. Even the more recently founded New Development Banks, which was created by the BRICS nations, is very similar in what it wants to achieve. And that's because outside of the developed world, there are still many countries that still lack simple infrastructure programs that can really help a good percentage of their population get out of poverty and also subsistence living. I mean, just think about it, in most rural places in the world, pavement is actually quite limited, and so travel is primarily done on dirt paths, gravel roads, and other unsealed surfaces. This drastically reduces the speed of travel and also increases wear and tear on vehicles and the people driving the vehicles. And so let's say you're in an undeveloped rural area and you have to drive 40 miles to work every day 
on a motorcycle. That trip will take around two hours because conditions are so terrible, about twice as long as it would take in a more developed country that has a proper highway. This means this laborer will spend four hours of his life commuting to work and back. Uh, that motorcycle is extremely dangerous when compared to a car. And if he gets injured, that could be really bad for his family if he's the sole breadwinner. Those four hours that he loses every day also means less time spent with his kids or less time spent doing personal development so that he could utilize new technologies like the internet to make himself more money and improve his life. And here's the thing, his local country, his local region might not be able to collect taxes from the people in that area because everyone's really poor and so they don't have the money to develop the roads. Perhaps the entire economy in the area is based on cash and under the table transactions because of the lack of government infrastructure and funding in the area. Of course, that just leads to more poverty, more people that are not efficiently creating capital, and that leaves the entire place underdeveloped. Now, I admittedly love going to places like this, you know, where you're free to do whatever you want, where you don't see government interference or bureaucracy anywhere. But still, infrastructure programs like paved roads instead of gravel roads, or better yet, freight and passenger rail lines instead of just roads will lead to more and more economic opportunities because individuals and goods will be able to travel further and further away at cheaper prices and faster speeds. Actually, one of the coolest parts of the Avatar series is not what happens on Pandora, but what happens on Earth. You see the RDA, that's the big bad company that tries to exploit the resources on Pandora. They start out as a transportation company on Earth. And their biggest achievement was creating a rapid transportation system for the entire planet. It's essentially a train that goes, you know, around the whole world. This allows Earth to efficiently move its entire labor force to any part of the planet that needs development. It also doesn't impinge on the cultural values of the host population because these workers can just take the train back home to their country when it's all done. This is a massive leap in public transportation at a global scale, and maybe one day it could happen here on Earth as well, just not in the current political and economic situation we're in. But I do see signs of this happening in small ways everywhere. I mean, for instance, I talked about the time I learned how to ride a motorcycle in our last video. I did it during a trip in the Himalayas on a journey from a city called Manali to Leh. It's a 400 kilometer trip that starts at around 2,000 meters, extends up to 5,000 meters in altitude and winds back down to 3,500 meters. This trip used to involve several summits, which involve slow and windy roads to the top of these epic peaks. And most motorcyclists actually break this 400 kilometer trip into two days and they rest somewhere in between, which is really not fun because you know, like you already don't have enough oxygen at high altitude and when you sleep, you actually breathe even less. You just get these terrible, terrible headaches. But thanks to efforts by India's military and the Border Roads Organization, the new Atal Tunnel was opened in 2020 and it'll allow travelers to avoid several peaks and shorten the overall journey between Manali and Leh. This is happening everywhere around the world. More and more remote locations are becoming more and more accessible now because of infrastructure programs and the people living in these remote areas are getting new financial and education opportunities as a result. The city of Leh used to be more or less unreachable during the winter due to the blizzards that would block the passes, but thanks to the invention of airplanes, now it's possible to fly to Leh even in the coldest days of winter. And this is the general trend that is happening in our world. It took Columbus around 61 days to cross the Atlantic, and now more than half a millennia later, the Queen Mary II could make a trip from New York to London in just five days. And if you hop on an airliner and hit the jet stream at the right time, you could do that trip in under five hours. And the Concorde, well, she used to fly at Mach 2 and could make that crossing in just under three hours. But that whole platform would be shelved because of financial reasons and safety reasons. But that's just a small setback. The overall trend is that it's becoming easier and easier, faster and faster, cheaper and cheaper to travel across the planet. On top of that, you also have social media platforms like Instagram to thank for inspiring people to travel to beautiful places. You have entire YouTube channels that are devoted to traveling to different cultures, art, music, and that has inspired more and more people to travel. If you take a look at Americans, for instance, in 1989, only around 7.2 million, or 3% of the population owned passports. Now in 2023, around 160 million Americans have passports. That's around 40% of the population. And when these Americans return home from their trips abroad, they bring back, you know, stories, gifts to their family and friends. They share pictures, images on social media and inspire even more people to go out there and explore. A percentage of these individuals might start seeking the cultures they consumed overseas at home. And thanks to the the diversity of our country here in the United States, you probably can find that culture somewhere 
at least in most major cities. New York City proudly has over 200 different languages spoken in its streets and more than 200 different types of cuisines for people to eat. To me, in many ways, New York City has always represented the future, all the good, the blending of human cultures and art, and the beauty that emerges from that chaos. And the bad, which is the chaos that usually erupts when you have so many different people coming to one place. You know, there's clashing of values, of beliefs, and other things, but hopefully everything will work out eventually. Now the thing with psychohistory or predicting the behavior of humans as a civilization is that there are too many factors to take into account. It's just simply not possible. In 1957, for instance, Chinese economist Ma Yinchu presented his new population theory, which proposed this idea that China was heading towards a population boom that would essentially cause millions to starve to death and threaten the entire country's existence. His theory was ridiculed and seen as an affront to the socialist movement, and he was actually labeled as like kind of an enemy of the state and he was removed from public society for this theory. It's kind of like this cancel culture we have here now on college campuses. But then in 1979, Ma Yinchu's new population theory once again returned to the limelight and was received with growing concern. You see, by 1979, people were starting to believe that Ma Yinchu's theory was actually going to happen and so he was actually rehabilitated, although he died just like three years later. He didn't get to enjoy the rehabilitation that much. The Chinese Communist Party would follow Yin Chu's suggestion that government mandate fertility controls on the population, which resulted in the disastrous one-child policy, which created one of the biggest demographic challenges any country has ever faced in human history. You see, what Ma Yin Chu and the Chinese government got wrong was that as living standards increased for Chinese families and the cost of living increased, birth rates would also naturally slow down, especially because of the rapid urbanization of China. The one-child policy was cruel, it was brutal. I mean, they forced the abortion of so many people. It is ridiculous. And it turns out it was probably never necessary. China, as we see now, would become a more developed country and the population's growth would also slow down as a result. And now China's population growth is heading towards a future that looks quite similar to Japan and South Korea. It's possible that their situation will get even worse. They'll have a massive elderly population that continues to grow every day and a much smaller working age population that is supposed to somehow keep society afloat. In the same way, we can't really predict what will happen on Earth and how population trends will continue. And any technocrat who tells you that he actually has an algorithm that can predict human behavior is probably trying to scam you. But here's the thing. There's something off about Coruscant and how it's portrayed in Star Wars. It's estimated that the planet of Coruscant is around the same size as Earth, yet its planet-wide city has a population of only around 1 to 2 trillion. Now you might be thinking, Alan, what do you mean only 1 to 2 trillion? That's like an unfathomable number to a species that only has 8 billion people, right? Well, here's the thing. If all of Earth's landmass was as dense as a city like Tokyo, which has a population of about 16,000 people per square mile, then the entire Earth would have a population of, get this, over 895 trillion people, or several hundred times more than the population of Coruscant. And remember, 70% of Earth is covered in water, whereas Coruscant's world city covers the entire planet. And obviously, in a square mile in Coruscant, there's definitely far more than 16,000 people per square mile. I mean, the city extends like a dozen miles into the death. This means that Coruscant either has terrible records of its demographics, which is very possible, or that the whole scale thing is off, or they're just counting only humans as people. <laughs> now, this number should also show us just how much room there is left on Earth. The reality is, for the next few hundred years, We'll still be building horizontally, and only in the biggest and most crowded cities and nations will you see more vertical type construction, like in Hong Kong, Tokyo, cities like Chongqing, New York City, London, places that attract humans like moths to a flame, which in turn attracts real estate projects and developments that become increasingly ambitious in their verticality. And so will Earth ever turn into a worldwide city? Well, just like how I can appreciate the concept of psychohistory, but I have no idea how humanity will ever create an algorithm that can predict human behavior, I also really like this idea of Ecumenopolis, but I have no idea how humanity will get there. In this video though, we have kind of laid out a few of the societal challenges that humanity will face uh, you know, all the barriers we're gonna have to leap over so that at least the government and societal structure is built in a way where we're unified enough to actually share the same city. All the physical aspects, the construction, the resources, well, that might be something we need to discuss in another video because we're running out of time. Anyway guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, my name is Alan reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, the democracy. See you next time.